Welcome to Leader You by Black River Performance Management, where we believe work should fuel the human spirit, not drain it. In this leadership podcast, we will dive into the lived experiences of people flourishing in today's workplace and beyond. Join us to hear real life examples of experiences from our own lives and from the leaders we know and trust. Successful organizations are dependent on people being competent in their job. To prepare people to do the work, we must prepare them according to the skills, knowledge, and abilities required for the job correctly and consistently. One of the services Black River offers is evaluating employee and candidate competencies. Our 25 competency assessment focuses on the soft skills, or what we like to call them, essential skills. Our competency assessment is used for more accurate hiring practices as well as for staff development. Every organization could use these competencies to ensure an individual's skills match the soft skills required by the job, to nurture the right talent, to improve productivity, and to develop dynamic leaders. For a sample of the 25 leadership competencies, definitions, and assessment, email us at info at blackriverpm.com. All right. Thank you for joining the Leader You podcast, where we talk about 25 different leadership competencies. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Connie Miller. She is the CEO of Credible Advantage, a leadership and board development consulting business. Prior to Connie's recent retirement, she served as the president and CEO of Icon Credit Union. Connie is an author and enjoys sharing her insight through her book, Don't Sabotage Your Career. Connie was honored as one of Idaho's CEOs of influence for her leadership, integrity, vision, diversity, and influence. In addition to her many awards, Connie was also awarded the Thanks Badge to the highest award in Girl Scouting and most recently Meridian Chamber of Commerce's Business Leader of the Year for 2021. Connie's gift is helping others discover life, sorry, discover joy in life and grow in their leadership and career journey. Her passions include building strong leaders and strong cultures in the workplace. Connie has served on many local boards and committees, including Board of Positions for Junior Achievement, Federal Reserve Bank Community Council, College of Western Idaho Foundation, St. Alphonsus Finance Committee, Girl Scouts, and the Arid Club. Under Connie's leadership, Icon Credit Union was named the seventh healthiest credit union for more than 5,400 credit unions in the nation. Icon Credit Union was the recipient of best places to work for several years and just one of the many community recognitions received. Thank you for joining us, Connie, and for taking your time to be on this podcast talking today about customer service, customer focus. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah. The reason I had you on the podcast today, well, there's multiple reasons. You're a a subject matter expert in the field of finance and leadership. and, And I know I've worked together with you a couple of years. We've done, Uh we both, we both share the same passion of bringing joy to the workplace and creating systems and training and, and tools for people to be more successful in the workplace so that they feel like they have that competency and that skill set. And I've just been impressed by you and how much you care about your people and the, you know, the clients that you work with and how you say yes to the things you want to do. And um, you, you've really kind of gotten dialed into what you really, you know, living in your purpose and things that bring you joy. And so, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a joy. It's super fun. Yeah. Do you want to share your story about, you know, how you got into credit unions, and then, you know, now you've since I would say repurposed instead of retired. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I've been very blessed uh, to first of all have incredible mentors uh, throughout my career that have been there uh, along the way. But yeah, I started uh, my early in my career. Uh, got an accounting degree from Boise State and was in finance. And I actually uh, remember very clearly trying to decide what type of accounting job I wanted because it was always really important to me to work for an organization that stood for something. The numbers are great, but I, I wanted to be more than just a number cruncher. And uh, so through that experience, I uh, actually had a few job offers and ended up selecting uh, a job at the Girl Scouts early in my career because I didn't quite have the confidence that 
to do the real world of accounting. And I thought I would just work there a year, maybe two, and then branch out into um, public accounting. Uh, 12 years later, uh, as I just absolutely loved that position and everything that I was learning. But I did wake up one day and I really was ready for more. I had learned everything we could do, transferred uh, systems, uh, all kinds of things. So that's how I landed in the credit union world is I accepted a job as a VP of finance for an organization called Idaho Corporate Credit Union. And that was in the mid 90s. And at that time, every state, uh, for the most part, had a a corporate credit union where all the credit unions uh, did their processing, their wire transfers, their loans. They acted kind of like a Federal Reserve Bank does to credit unions uh, and banks. And so uh, we were basically a wholesale credit union. Uh, That was a very challenging job. Uh, It was very dysfunctional culture. Uh, The leadership uh, lacked strategic focus. Uh, And I remember on more than one occasion, the the prior organization had hired some people that didn't work out and they kept asking me to kind of come back and and I could have easily done that. Uh, And I just made the decision that I'm learning more in this environment than I can ever learn in a textbook about leadership and Mm -hmm. management and culture. And so I stuck with it uh, for a couple years. And then I was very blessed. Our treasurer of our board was the CEO at Icon. And uh, they opened up a new VP of finance position over at Icon. And so a couple years later, I moved over there. And then I was there 23 years and was just very blessed. So I did the finance role again. I stayed in finance for about 10 years uh, during that time and then was blessed to uh, uh, get the CEO role. And so um, I did the CEO role for about 13 years. Uh, And we had actually an acquisition and a merger late in my career the last year, which was kind of interesting. And uh, I had already planned to retire. My husband and I both had said uh, we want to go do some of the things that we want to do. And we started planning that probably 15 years ago to retire when I turned 60. And we did it. And it's it's been a wonderful experience. That's incredible. Well, you're not retired because you're working. Right. I know I say retire (laughs) only because I don't have the Monday to Friday uh, show up at the office job anymore. But uh, what I did, which was really fascinating, and I would encourage anyone to do this when you're going through a big change in your life and your career, is about six months before... I uh, retired, I met, I picked, I made a list of about 20 people that were real influential in my life and that had worked with me close, Mm -hmm. that knew me well. And uh, I knew that what I didn't want to do was take all my life experiences and leadership and go golf with them. I I knew I wanted to do something. Uh, I did want to learn to play golf, but I didn't want it to be all my retirement years. I also didn't want to get so busy that I would wake up and be 90 and say, where did retirement years go? So I I was very uh, disciplined to try and I interviewed um, these 20 people and I I just asked them a couple questions, which was knowing me, where's my natural gifts and talents where and then what's the need in the world? If I could only be do a few things in my uh, post full time job, basically, uh, in do some consulting, what would it be? And I journaled it and there was common themes that came out of it. And then I looked at the list and I said, okay, of this, what's going to bring me joy? What am I going to be most excited about when I look at my calendar that day? Uh, and I had no idea it, if I would be busy or not busy or, you know, but mm-hmm. I stayed very dialed into the alignment of what was important to me and what would change and have an impact on the world, but also bring me joy in that consulting. And it was pretty, it was pretty cool process. It really, uh, it really secured in my mind what I would be doing uh, in this next journey. That is incredible. What a tool for our listeners. 20 people, those people that have been influenced in your life, interview them, ask them what they think your skills you bring to the world, and then asking yourself, which ones of these would bring me passion, which would bring me joy, what is going to fuel my spirit? That is incredible. Yes, and and I learned some things in there. So, you know, everyone sees you in in your walk of life, and 
there were some things I didn't expect. Uh, one of them that came up several times was you really need to help people create a professional brand that we have um, amazing talented executives out there, but they're doing things to hurt their brand. And it was fascinating because that's what motivated me to write my book mm-hmm. on don't sabotage your career, but I didn't ever think about doing consulting around it. Uh, and so that has surfaced and, and I've built a lot of that into my executive coaching and it's been really fruitful. Absolutely. I'll have to read that book and see if there's some tips in there I can use with my coaching clients as well. That I would <laughs> love that. Um, I, I think that's just, it takes intention. Like you said, you use the word discipline and intention. And I think that is something that when we get on the hedonic treadmill of life and we just get busy, we forget to stop and and do these important things or to put them in our calendar, you know, the self-development, the reflection times. Um, I've been doing some research for a talk that I'm going to be doing on work-life balance and, you know, uh, if that exists in, in those things. But I think one of the things is, is we forget to put the time to reflect. We forget to to put the time to plan for the future. We forget to put those important things on the calendar. And so you even mentioned that you were planning your retirement for 15 years. You you knew that you wanted to, to retire at 60. So I think that the important thing that we're looking at here too is, is that you've been intentional and disciplined about what you're wanting to do. And then you're actually asking a lot of people what, you know, what you're good at. That is incredible. Just great skills for people that are listening. Yes. Thank you. It was very insightful. I think the other thing that's really important that a lot of people don't do is have that real uh, deep intentional conversation with your uh, spouse, if you have one and the people that are going to share this journey with you. Uh, Because there was this major aha with my husband and I, where, you know, people talk about retirement all the time and they focus on where they're going to travel, maybe where they're going to volunteer, you spend more time with grandkids. Uh, But in the end, what was fascinating is my husband and I had this conversation about what could blow our lives up today. Like we worked so hard to get to this point. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about what could blow it up because in business, we always need to be saying that, right? Mm -hmm. What could take our business down? We need to be paying attention to those things. Uh, And so what's the, what happens when the competitor moves in across the street and, you know, overnight type of thing. And from that conversation, it was pretty powerful because the first one that came up is our health. Uh, and, you know, I mean, if we get unhealthy and, and we're not around, it's going to be hard to enjoy retirement. Um, uh, the second was, um, certainly our, our family and, you know, if something happens to our family and our kids, and then also our relationship, if something happens to our relationship, it could kind of blow it all up. Uh, and kind of faith came in all of this, you know, as well. But then the other thing is my husband is, he's so wise. He said, you know, I just had this major aha. And he said, for years, you've, you, we were looking at retirement differently. You're looking at retirement based on what you're going to be doing when you no longer have your CEO job. And he said, I'm looking at retirement based on where I'm going to be. And they're two very different things. And so we had a wonderful discussion about how do we blend these two? How do I do consulting without it causing any interruption in where we're going to be? We have a little place in Arizona now in the wintertime because we hate the cold. And how are we going to do all of this and kind of collaborate together with it? So it's all the same stuff we need to be doing in business, right? Uh, We need to be having these strategic slow down and have these strategic uh, discussions, Mm -hmm. Um, just like we're going to talk today a little bit about um, our customers and customer focus. Uh, So often we just kind of wait for the next customer to come in but we don't have a focus on what the vision is of what the ideal customer is, for example. Yeah, I love that. That's a great segue into just thinking about from a credit union perspective and even now um, as as the customers that you have uh, and the clients. Uh, Let's talk about customer service. What what does that look like? What does a good job look like? Um, How do you be strategic in the way that you are in selecting the customers you want to work with, maybe not in the credit union, you kind of take whoever walks through the Mm -hmm. door, right? But Mm -hmm. as a consultant or a coach, you kind of have the autonomy to say, 
yeah, I don't think this is a good fit, but here's another person, um, or this is out of my line, or that's not really my line. Right. Well, one thing that uh, we do, I just think back at times in the credit union, the conversations about who's our ideal member and who are we serving, and you can't serve everybody. And you also can't be like your competitor, um, exactly like your competitor down the street. Sometimes there was some big credit unions in the area, and, and my team would occasionally say something like, well, they're doing this or they're doing that. And I said, how do we create our own unique business model? Uh, because we're we're us, mm-hmm. we're not them. And I definitely think it's important to always pay attention to your competitors, but use it to your advantage, not as a detriment. Uh, and so, for example, for many, many years, uh, our ideal customer was uh, was not big business. It was consumer, and and we got really, really good about doing that really well and bringing in financial education to help every consumer build their um, financial success. And uh, and so not thinking that we had to jump into uh, many years ago, we didn't even do mortgages, I remember. And uh, and so we realized if we're going to serve a consumer well, we need, and this was way back when we were a little, little credit union. Mm-hmm. Uh, fast forward to today in consulting, uh, I do actually think about where I can have the biggest impact. And I select the customers that really are doing it because they want to grow as well. Uh, in my executive coaching, uh, I have amazing clients that are, some of them are paying their own executive coaching fees because they really want to grow as a leader and it's important to them. And so I ask really good questions about what does success look like on at the end of this to get a feel for their commitment to it. And also, uh, are they doing it for the right reasons? Are they doing this just because someone told them they needed to do that? Uh, bringing in a staff team training, for example, are, are we doing it because the leaders just don't want to deal with things in their own organization and they want a consultant to come in and try to fix it in one day training? Or is this adding on to a lot of investment of building culture and those types of things? So what I would say in general is make sure you're really taking the time to ask the right questions about serving your customers and also how you want to serve them. Uh, One of the um, wonderful things that I learned is, and I had amazing mentors that helped me with this, is stay very focused on your vision when you're trying to decide all your new platforms and your new products and uh, and try not to listen to every new idea that comes in because you can't serve everybody and you can't provide every service and product. Uh, and you can get off track sometimes. Sometimes businesses get off track because they focus primarily on maybe profit. And th- then either they're miserable or they don't serve well uh, as a result of that because they totally forgot the mission. Mm -hmm. of what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, I can remember like a a profound moment one time when our credit union, uh, it was starting to become a common practice that credit unions, mostly in many banks, would charge a fee if you had an automatic transfer from a savings to a uh, from your savings to a checking account for like if you overdrafted your account. And even though there's an opportunity to charge a fee for that and have the system automated and and that all costs a little bit of money, we went right to our vision statement, which is building financial success. And to get those two in sync with each other, it's really important, right? And we said, how is penalizing someone that's building a savings account for a rainy day or if they make a mistake, how is that building financial success? We want to encourage them to have a savings account and, mm-hmm. and have it be there. And so even though you can pick up some income, for example, in that example, we we said this doesn't fit the mission. It's not yes. our customer focus of what we're trying to accomplish. So I think always going back to your mission statement and your vision of what you're trying, who your ideal customer is, is really important. Yeah, that alignment is so key. Uh, mm-hmm. in bringing and tying it back. And we work with a lot of nonprofits that are mission focused and, all, and credit unions are nonprofit as well. Um, most of them are, mm-hmm. are all, all yes. yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. And so uh, I think that's super important. Um, and I don't think it, it happens as often as needed. Like I, I, right. I, I've even seen a, let's just say in a specific example where Maybe somebody was trying to hire for a new position and 
they weren't willing to pay enough a livable wage in that area, but they're promoting things that help help you know that help people in those income categories in their communities, but yet they were because they were a nonprofit wanting to pay a wage that was not very livable. And I was like, hey, now how does this tie mm-hmm. up with your mission? You, you're going to have to find some funds. Otherwise, you're you're part of the problem that you're trying yes. to ask people to s- solve by donating money. So you can't do that. <laughs> no. And um, you raised, it, it, you really, that's a really good point. Uh, you know, I've served on, I think I added up one day, 20 boards and board committees. Mm-hmm over my career. And so I've seen all those boardroom discussions about budgets and and are we going to get the funding in and how do we get new donors and all those things that come with um, in living in the world of, and I, my whole career was working for um, not for profits or nonprofits. Mm. So, uh, but um, there is a really good trend out there of really educating boards that operational effectiveness and getting the right team to carry you forward. Uh, but it requires the board to be very strategic and to understand you can take a risk and pay more as long as you're strategic about accountability and mm-hmm. uh, all of those things. And so uh, I think we are, we're actually seeing foundations and others uh, stepping up a little and funding a little bit more of building infrastructure uh, to be able to have the long-term success. There's a high turnover in nonprofits mm-hmm. and it's a combination of um, overwork and underpaid, mm-hmm. you know, um, really great humans, but. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I have a couple of, well, a few executive, um, directors that are, that are coaching clients that I, I see that they're, they're overworked and underpaid. And it, it's one of those things where they're constantly having to ask, is this, this, is this sustainable? Or maybe, maybe I worked super hard and I had to keep everything afloat and work with my team through COVID. And now I've set this new precedent. And now I feel like I can't, now this is the new expectation. And, and some of these things aren't sustainable. So then they have to ask themselves, they have to talk to their boards. They, they need to find out, you know, they have to have these difficult conversations and then they need to choose if they're going to stay there any longer or if they just need to move on because it's no longer going to serve them because yes. they're not heard by their board either. That's customer service as well, right? Yes. Um, you know, it's hard being a CEO of a nonprofit mm-hmm. because you have many bosses uh, and many boards Um I'm just going to be frank here. Many boards don't invest in their own professional development. Oh, I know. And they're yeah. and they're leading these these really impactful organizations. But it, you see, uh, even at the CEO level, you see a lot of turnover. And so, you know, my board um, at Icon, we were just we brought in education all the time because mm-hmm. it was so important. And and not only that. As a volunteer board member, there's nothing worse than showing up to a board meeting. It's the same all on and on, review the financial statements. And um, you have to go excited that you're going to learn something in return. And uh, boards, to, if they add education and, and it can be anything. I remember when we started serving different demographics, we brought in speakers to talk about their culture. And uh, in our board meeting, which didn't feel like that was really a uh, direct correlation to uh, financial services, but it was important. And the board really appreciated all of the variety in that. They look forward to the meetings, and I mm-hmm. think that's important too. Yeah, and and I think people that are on board boards, they are looking for their own development. It's part of the reason they joined a board, because they wanted new experiences, and they wanted new connections, and they wanted... There's a reason why they did it, and it's not just so that they can review financial statements and, and have, um, you know, even... The, the meetings need to be generative where, where there's connection and, their, and their, their talents are also being utilized, right? I think that's another yes. part of customer service and, and just having people feel appreciated is when you, you know what the people's talents are. And oftentimes, this, as a CEO or an executive director, you don't have all of that information. Maybe you have a board of 20 people. How do you get to know them if you're not taking time for board development, team building to get to know who they are, what their talents are, what their strengths are, and build a deeper relationship than the transactional, I show up and uh, and vote, 
and yes, um, one of the exercises that I do in my board um, governance uh, and uh, effective board leadership consulting is uh, do a complete list of every skill set that w- that you need in your credit union uh, for leadership. And this is everything from legal to finance to marketing. And then also look at the demographics of your board. And that's that's age and um, all kinds of things. And have each board member check all the boxes where they have experience in it. And then take a step back and look at all the gaps. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing how we have boards that aren't representative of who we're serving. Mm -hmm. And we have big gaps in leadership. And I remember uh, Icon, at Icon, our board, we had an amazing board. And we were talking about expanding branches, for example. And we looked around the room and we said, we have no expertise in development and real estate and so let's get a board member that has that expertise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so getting um, very strategic about that. Uh, the, the challenge is that I think I read an article one day. I don't know the source that 12 percent of the population are naturally strategic. And so what that says is we have to teach our leaders how to be strategic. Mm-hmm. And that means slowing down and being very methodical about how do we make good decisions about who we're going to serve if. We don't even have that demographic in a boardroom. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the things, I love talking to you because you see the same things that we see in, in board development. And, and we probably see, it'd be fun to just have a conversation about the challenges. Um, and, and, and it also helps, like, for, from our perspective as a consultant, there's oftentimes when you can see if it's going to be helpful for you to work with them or if this is just a checking of the box type of thing. Yes, I've had some um, interesting experiences and I'm learning to ask more questions when I work with boards because one of the most critical things I'm seeing is the board chair has got to be a courageous leader. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting because boards want to know how they can do better. They want you to come in and do the assessment. They want you to be the strategic thinker and help them through strategic planning. But and but once you deliver that information, which is all from their own feedback, if you don't have a board chair that is courageous enough to take it and keep working with it, because sometimes you are going to open up some weaknesses and you need to go to work on them, then the whole board gets frustrated. And then you have turnover on the board and then it, it just isn't a good situation. So uh, boards have to be really committed if they want to do board development, that they're really going to grow as a board, um, which takes courage, uh, mm-hmm. and it takes a good leader uh, at the, in that chair role. I think it also takes humility. I I run into mm-hmm. it often that we're like we have it all figured out. We don't need help. We're not. We don't. You know. And one of my things is like, you, when is the best time to fix your roof? When it's not leaking. Right. That's when right. it's time to do development. You don't wait till. And oftentimes, it doesn't matter if it's an organization or a board or what what it is, you don't wait until the culture is completely horrible to start making problems or changing things and and trying to, and oftentimes we see this, it's so late that it takes so much time. You you can absolutely turn it around, but it's Mm -hmm. it's, however long it took to get there is probably how long it's going to take to turn it around. So uh, that would be one thing that I would say, like, as far as customer service, um, having mm-hmm. humility to recognize that you don't know it all and that mm-hmm. um, bringing in subject matter experts and people from different industries um, to so that you, you can serve better. Um, yes. One of I the, think. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one of the other things we see as as people come onto boards so like let's say you want somebody with this board wants somebody with financial experience okay so we bring in somebody from a banking industry and all of a sudden but it's a nonprofit that we're running and so even though we need this person with this person that comes onto our board that has finance background and they are good at accounting or whatever that doesn't mean they're an expert in this industry or in this organization. And that's something that I think that needs to be addressed because we have to recognize that they don't know the culture of this group. So a brand new board member needs onboarded accordingly 
some service for them to find out who are they as an individual, what are their strengths, where do they need help understanding the laws are different for nonprofits, right? The team right. is yes. different, you know. Uh, the personalities, the culture is made up of humans, and so yep. as we look at that, we have to recognize even though they're a subject matter expert at their bank and they probably are nailing it all there. When we bring them on to our boards, it's not serving them well or our boards to just assume they know everything and that they're ready to no, go. You're absolutely right. And a good board orientation should be several hours, in my opinion. Uh, we would literally, we would take every new board member before their first meeting, and we would go through, for example, the entire board packet, and we would talk about appropriate things to look at for things that are appropriate, things that you should ask questions about, trends you should be paying attention to. But also in, in that whole thing, there's always your management reports and all that. That's when you talk about learn the history, like get and, and they board members need equal orientation same with team members. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how many employees are brought in and thrown right on the front line without giving the history either. And so how do you even know how to serve when you haven't even been told what your service protocol is? Uh, and board members are the same. And I, the other thing is there's a huge advantage to adding advisory committees, mm -hmm. advisory boards that are non-voting. Uh, we actually did this at the credit union because we said, okay, our new target market is our 20 to 30 year olds. And we looked around the room and we didn't have anyone even close to that age. And so I remember we recruited a couple advisory board members. One was an NNU student. And one day in the board meeting, they're talking about branch location and everything. And he said, I'm not going into your branch. I'm going to use your online banking and I want an online loan application. And so they can add value mm -hmm. uh, if you can add them. So even if you don't find the right person, add them as an advisory uh, mm -hmm. because they can be very helpful. Yeah, we used a lot of those in higher ed. We had technical advisory committees and a lot of different people from around. And I think those are super helpful and you can bring a lot of talent um, and different perspectives into your organization or your board. So you brought up a good point as the frontline workers. I, I see this a lot too. They don't get the accurate training. They're just thrown to the wolves and, and then you're expecting them to give incredible customer service. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So one thing that's really critical is uh, get your team very focused on the impact they're making um, in your customers' lives. Uh, you know, at the credit union, no one wakes up and goes in to make a deposit at the credit union. And, and that's a chore to them, right? They don't get excited and say, yeah, yeah, I get to go, you know, get some cash today or get to go make a deposit or I get to go sign some loan docs, whatever. And so I remember um, really going the extra mile to communicate the impact we were having uh, on a teller. And also, uh, the impact that uh, your frontline people have. So we did this uh, fun exercise where for one month, all of all of our entire employee base had little yellow tablets and they t made a tick mark every single time they touched the customer. And whether it was phone, whatever, everyone, I even did it. And then we tallied all those in a month and we showed how many members were touched in a month. And so we had our tellers, which was our biggest bottom platform mm -hmm. they touched i remember 17,000 times they touched mm -hmm. members i touched five members and so we had a pyramid which was wonderful of each level in the organization the vps how much did they touch which was less right i think it was probably 60 or something i don't mm -hmm. remember the exact figures but i just remember this visual of showing the tellers how they were the most important people in the organization that connected with our members and um and oftentimes we allow even our employees to say things like, I'm just a teller. It's like, you are not just a teller. Mm -hmm. Like, look at this. You have such an impact on our customers. So customer service is getting them to feel that they're important, especially mm -hmm. your front line, but even your back office people, maybe auditing, right? Where they never touch a member, getting them to understand how their impact on their job is impacting the overall customer experience and tying everything to your customer. Uh, and oftentimes in business, we tie things to profitability mm -hmm. and we forget that it's about the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And the more, the better you treat your people, the better they actually 
treat the customers. And, and mm-hmm. they're incredible recruiters for um, good employees, right? And when you treat your employees well, they will be your best recruiters. And mm-hmm. in today's world where recruitment and, and hiring is very difficult, uh, you have to be genuine about treating your employees well. And it doesn't mean you give the farm away mm-hmm. and you, you um, lose money as a business by, you know, um, doing crazy things. It's little things. It's a, a fun little, you know, we used to do these minute to win it's, for example, and just fun little things just to uh, show that you care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I love just the little ideas that you've given uh, as examples, uh, especially like just the little tick marks and, and, get, and showing a visual. Those are just easy ways to help people feel appreciated and get back to that alignment of this is why you're here tying it into, you know, their, their fuel. Um, most people, people are working for a purpose. They want to have an impact. They want to do meaningful work. Um, and not every job is our favorite job, but it's sometimes it's the job we have to do to just make ends meet and put food on the table. And sometimes it's a, it's an in-between job, but I would say for tellers, another thing or people in the frontline work, rather that's tellers or people in in community action agencies that are frontline or anybody that's um, essential worker uh, frontline, oftentimes, well, there's a loneliness epidemic right now. And Mm -hmm. that is actually worse on our health than smoking and drinking. People are more disconnected than ever. And there's an actual warning from the Surgeon General. And I think that, that if our employees that are on that level can connect and build relationships with their the people they see every day, that they make eye contact with them, that they mm-hmm. smile, that they're happy to see them, that they remember them, that they know that they went on vacation, that they know that they're great, they just got back. Or uh, this happened to me the other day. I walked into my credit union and I deposited a check and one of the tellers said, that is that's going to have to take a couple of days to clear. Um, and I said, I I said, that's okay. And then somebody, another teller looks over and she says, is that black river? You're good. Go ahead and remove that. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just, and it happened to be one of our clients too. So I, I, I sent a text right away and I was like, great customer service. And not that I want special treatment, but somebody recognized me, somebody knew, somebody mm-hmm. somebody went out of their way for me, and that made me feel really appreciated, which doesn't happen in banking or credit unions very often that right. I've found, that I've experienced. Yeah. And yeah. so it makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. It does. Uh, that was one of the reasons I absolutely loved uh, the credit union industry as a whole, because it is really people helping people. And it's phenomenal to have credit unions helping each other, you know, as mm-hmm. well, which is you just don't see that in other industries. Uh, but it really was about how do we how do we step out of our uh, normal routine and go. I remember going to a one of our members 90th birthday party and, you know, showing up and, you know, celebrating with him because he had been a member for years. And you just do things like that, that, uh, that, you know, have a, a big impact and you can have uh, flexibility and you just get to know them as people, mm-hmm. uh, which is, I mean, and for, for some uh, people, we were their social experience of the week. Mm-hmm. You know, they would come in once a week and, you know, get their cash and get their cup of coffee. And we were, that was part of, of the journey of their relationship with us. So I think that's really important. I think we get, uh, we lose sight and to do what we're talking about requires really good leadership to help people, um, to be there, to coach them on how to have a conversation, to coach them on being inquisitive and not, you know, and empowering people to make an exception when needed, you know, Mm -hmm. just like that, um, that lady did with that check, uh, make the exception is wonderful, you know, mm-hmm. listen and for those opportunities, because, uh, that's where you can create a uh, monumental impact. Absolutely. I, as I think about it, I, I, I think about anybody that's in a frontline or new manager position. Oftentimes new managers were really good at their job and now they've been put in charge of a team and then they get no leadership training. 
So mm-hmm. we're really not doing them any favors to set or setting them up for success or customer or even employee satisfaction because we actually haven't even given them any tools to be successful. And we think that, oh, just because they're good at their job, they'll be good at leading people. It's a completely different different task it's a different, and skill set. Yes, different skill set. And, uh, you know, leaders, uh, I mean, leadership comes very natural to some but every leader needs tools. needs some professional tools. development and tools and tips because our personalities are all unique. And uh, one of the biggest things that I saw um, that really we put a lot of uh, time and effort into was how to have a really good, crucial conversation. Mm-hmm. It's a missing skill right now. And you can never deliver a really good performance evaluation or coach people along the way well if you are afraid of having crucial conversations and being honest um, with integrity with feedback and even teaching people how to receive feedback is uh, needed today so you're right we get to where we are as we grow our career by being really good accurate doers and timely doers and good work ethic and all those things but there is this bridge you have to cross when you get into leadership, especially when you're leading other humans mm-hmm. that all have different personalities. And in addition, you've got strategies going on and all kinds of distractions. You have to work on leadership, building leadership skills. And, you know, I always found it really fascinating because I loved reading uh, leadership books and every I could read the same book three years apart and get completely different because your situations change around you mm-hmm. all the time. Uh, we also have to be very open to, uh, even as CEOs, our own executive leadership. Uh, it's fun because I'm working with several CEOs now uh, in my consulting. I just love it. But I had that time in my journey, uh, it was probably five years before I retired, that we had all of a sudden grown really fast. We became a much more complex organization. Stuff started just happening that didn't feel right. And it was there was days where it wasn't fun and it was like, what is going on? And I remember hiring an executive coach for me to say, I need to make sure I don't need to change as well. And I learned some things through that on where I thought I was empowering people. I was actually hindering and Mm -hmm. a few things there. And so I think we all have to be open to know that we're not failures when we ask for executive coaches. Uh, It's actually one of the best investments that you can have. Oh, it, it it makes all the difference for the people that I, I that I know that have I've had coaching myself. I wouldn't even be a coach if I didn't have one. I mean, uh-huh. you, you really have to believe in it. So I, I love uh-huh. the same thing. I have a lot of ex, uh, CEOs or executive directors, and what I, what they have found is that there's things they don't want to share with their board that they're working through in their mind. There's things they don't really want to share with their whole team yet. They have to kind of, they need somebody to process it with and they need that external perspective and they need somebody that will actually call them out. And Mm -hmm. it's generally not the people that work with them that will, you know, they'll tell them they'll, they'll actually hear what they need to hear versus what they want to hear. And that's what they, mm-hmm. they actually appreciate it. They want the feedback. They want the growth. And that's what that's my ideal client. I have to know that they're humble enough to yes. be vulnerable enough to actually get somewhere too. Because you could you could coach somebody, but if they're not willing to be completely honest with you and tell you how and then just tell you how they're doing amazing how much could you actually help? You're them? not making any progress. Yeah. And they're not learning from it as well. And they likely lack emotional intelligence mm-hmm. and all those other things that come with that type of personality. Uh, and they're usually not real effective. They have high turnover and mm-hmm. because no one wants to work for a leader that thinks that they're perfect. And mm-hmm. so I think growing together is important. When I, when I received my coaching, I told my whole team, you know, I'm going to get coaching and I had a full 360 done. So they got to provide feedback to my coach before and after. Mm-hmm. And I said, be honest. And uh, we're, you know, we're just like I expect all of you to uh, perfect your leadership skills and grow. I need to do the same. And I did learn a lot and mm-hmm. I was never the perfect leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did my best to be as good as I could. Uh, but, you know, things happen and you're going to react or say the wrong thing in Mm -hmm. that particular meeting. And the important part is that you stay humble and listen to feedback and welcome feedback. I love that. That's just, that's exactly just being 
the example you wish to see in others, right? That is, you're leading by example, and that right there, showing showing that kind of leadership skill of being humble, asking for 360s, those types of things. That's one thing that we do also. Um, I haven't had a lot of people wanting 360s, and we actually use, we do 360s um, as part of one of our one of our tools that we have, and I don't have as many people. Um, yeah, we, wanting, it's using. something people are afraid of. Yeah, uh, Leaders are afraid, and what they don't realize is that when you give a person an opportunity to share, I think the important part is, as a coach, it's important for me not to, it's important for me to keep a little bit of, of anonymous, you know, um, integrity to the situation. And really, I look for themes mm -hmm. when I'm doing 360s and be able to share. This isn't about who said what. Mm -hmm. It's about there's some themes that are showing up here. I usually discount the one offs that are me just because those are usually personality things. But uh, for some, yeah, for some, and I remember um, even being a little vulnerable, I included my whole board in mine. Uh, and I remember being a little bit vulnerable about, you know, and a little bit nervous, uh, about what, but there was nothing that was shared. That was a surprise. It's mm -hmm. just that someone needs to articulate it. Right. And, uh, and it was super helpful for me, uh, to be able to get that 360. But I do find that in some of my executive coaching, they will either be really selective about who gets who to have it. you talk to, uh, or, or they'll get a little bit, uh, you know, nervous about it. So it is important how, how the consultant handles the 360 as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say the same thing it's, as far as the patterns and, and themes, because there is always someone who is just doesn't like you, you know, and it doesn't matter even if you're a teacher, you know, your student evals, you'll always have one, one, but if, if these things happen over time and we see these, then, then, then that's yeah. an issue. And, um, I, I just think you can't, you can't get any better outcomes than, than finding out where you actually are getting a measurement of where am I, where the vibe, what is the vibe with me? Cause your perception of what you're doing is always different than other people's perception of you. And how could you actually enhance or improve if you don't know what you're doing that is annoying or that is, um, right. you know, is not helpful. Right. And, um, you know, receiving feedback is a gift and it's a gift that a lot of people don't realize how, a, what a powerful gift it is, mm -hmm. but having you be that type of person where people will give you feedback it is a huge gift. A lot of people don't get that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I would want, I would, I always said, I, I want that, even if I don't like it. I mean, yeah, I need to be tough at times when you're getting feedback. And sometimes it's totally not bounded, right? Mm -hmm. There's just like, there's nothing about this that is reality, but it's their perception. And so that's, that's gold in my mind is to get the feedback. And uh, one of the things that I see leaders do is they create uh, an aura about themselves where people are afraid to give them feedback. And so they're not going to get it then. Mm -hmm. uh, but the feedback is going to be shared with everyone else <laughs> instead of the person that can do something about it. Uh, and so that happens as well. So I always tell people a wonderful exercise to do is just list all the things that you hate when you want to give someone some good constructive criticism, the reactions that they give you that you hate which is defensiveness and deflection and um, even crying, all those things that some people do when you're going to give them really good feedback. And then just ask yourself, what are these things do I do? Because these are the things that make it difficult for me to want to go give that person additional feedback. Is there anything in this list that I have a tendency to do mm -hmm. uh, and focus on it? Oh, yeah. I do that in some of my communication courses with poor listening skills. So which ones are your favorite? Like, you know, which ones do you hate the most? And then everybody will say, oh, discounting, making f jokes, you know, interrupting. And then I'll ask them, now, which one is your default? Because we all have them. And we usually don't like in others what something that we do. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Yeah. Another thing that we do is we... We think, well, what do you think these people are here for? We, what, well, they're here. Why are you here working? What are you doing? Well, I want to serve. I want to serve uh, my purpose or my mission. I want to make an impact. Why are your employees here? Well, they want to make money. 
they want to, you know, they're, they're just trying to scam the system, whatever. It's like we have this ability to think that better things of ourselves, but not others. <laughs> And mm -hmm. the reality is everybody is working to do those types of things. We're trying to live out a purpose, create an impact, make a difference in the world. And, you know, we need help with some of those skills. And I think it's important that we recognize that not everybody, not many people actually right now have social emotion, strong social emotional skills and strong leadership skills. Those are absolutely things. The communication, like you said, the um, crucial conversations. The one we do, we have Blanchard, which is um, conversational capacity. But regardless mm -hmm. of whatever training or tools that you utilize, you the book Crucial Conversations in itself is incredible. I love that book. Yeah. Yes. And um, I, I just think improving your communication skills and giving feedback skills is the one thing that we see across all of the organizations that we work with too. That and different behavioral styles or personalities are even. Are, are better at it, and certain ones need work right out of the gate. We just know mm -hmm. these guys are going to be mm -hmm. more introverted. That they're they have a fear, uh, you know, all these things. So we can we can help miracle grow them, and get them to the place where they are more effective as a leader, as a customer, ser you know, and helping provide customer service, um, mm -hmm. or even being able to deal with difficult customers. Um, I think emotional intelligence training is huge for frontline workers because. They have to be able to read the emotions of other people. They need to understand the motion contagion. They need to understand how um, to make contact with somebody and ba people's basic psychological needs. When they understand that, they are more well-equipped to handle these strong emotions from customers that are screaming or, you know, understand how to deflect or how to meet right. people's needs and see that people, it's not personal. Uh, people are reacting based on a stimuli or some kind of, reaction and many people don't have that skill set and so no, we can build and, it you know we found it with our young uh, folks that we hired uh, most of them um, were tellers is so there's a couple observations that I had one is when because I I have three boys and I just watch them um, with their cell phones and one observation was that they because they text more they don't like phone calls right they text mm -hmm. more they get to choose when they're going to respond and how they respond in a live conversation at the teller counter where someone asks a question you have to respond on immediately right mm -hmm. and we actually had to work with them and help them with how to have conversations and respond and then you can only imagine um, the number of people that might come in and it's the teller's fault if they overdrafted their account or had a loan late fee or all those things to get them to not own that piece, exactly what you're saying. But there's conversation training that has to happen mm -hmm. in our young people uh, are it's why they hate making phone calls. It's why they don't want to just show up in a, in a group of strangers and have to have a a quick conversation because they aren't used to doing that. Yeah. And so we have to provide sim simulated environments, tra safe training environments to have these conversations where they feel comfortable, they can practice in their groups, and then it, mm -hmm. it's a skill like anything else. Yeah. And role playing is so valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes we don't, we do a training and then we don't role play to practice. Mm -hmm. And you can teach theory all day long, but until you actually role play, and having a role play environment where it's safe, right? You can be silly, you can have fun, you can make mistakes, you're not going to be perfect, you know. And I, we used to role play in boards all the time about how to ask donors for money because mm -hmm. it's something that board members are so afraid of doing. <laughs> yes. uh, and you have to practice that, yeah. and then it gets easier. Yeah, it's like your elevator speech. It's just right. it's just practicing it until you don't have to think about it anymore, and it becomes automatic. I, mm -hmm. I love all the tips that you have for our listeners and, and so much experience and just wisdom. Um, what are, when you're looking for an ideal client and how you think you'll be able to serve your customers the most, what would you say are the top few things that you're looking for so that you can provide excellent or legendary service? I am for sure looking for the customer that is, uh, wanting the consulting, wanting the additional expertise for the right reason. Uh, if it's just to get the promotion, to get more money, 
but they really don't want to grow or it's only because their boss told them they had to, which is an okay start. In other words, good bosses that are coaching their employees may say, I think you would find it really valuable to hire an executive coach. Uh, so that's by far my number one. Uh, commitment, the 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 ability to commit. Uh, and I do find the toughest ones are the ones that are, I call them efficiency experts, meaning what drives them is to be the most efficient throughout the day. And they see time and professional development as downtime or wasted time. Those are tough, right? Because they're, they're going to um, always have a higher priority than building their, uh, their uh, critical skills. Uh, so that one is something I look for. For boards, I really look for boards that uh, are really in it for the long haul and want to work as a group for the, for the good of the board uh, and, and courageous leaders within the board. Uh, because I find it's more disruptive if, if um, that isn't the case. And then um, for team trainings, I do a lot of culture trainings, leadership mm -hmm. trainings, uh, uh, all of those types of things. I really listen for the organization's commitment to the team professional development mm -hmm. and that it's not just because you've got one. Uh, so one of my most uh common presentations that I get asked to do more than probably anything else is my stomping out drama and uh, building accountable teams through good communication. But if the only reason that I'm coming in is they just have a whole bunch of drama, but the leader isn't invested in <laughs> providing, then that um, that doesn't go well. I, they still get good tips that they can use in their personal lives, but it's not um, it's not as, I want to make a difference, right? I want my time to be valuable. I want to be impactful on those that I work with. And I want to be fulfilled that people are growing through my efforts, uh, which might be a little selfish, but it's just, I, I really do. <laughs> I want to inspire uh, people to grow and build. And I think we all can do that. Yeah, I think so too. And it's super important to be intentional and, and ask the right questions to find out. And what I love, I also think this is a, a, a key for good customer service. For example, you do a lot of the same work that we do, but I would send a client to you and not worry about not having the client if I felt like it would be a better fit or you have a certain area of expertise or, you know, I think that the, 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 what she knows or, or the knowledge that she has would serve you better. Yeah, I could do this, but I think this person might be better for you. I'm really good at uh, finding affiliates. You're one of the affiliates that we would be like, hey... I know, like, and trust this leader. I think she does a great job, and I think she might be a better fit um, for that. Yes. And I think that's I something. Am, yeah. yeah, I'm very much the same uh, because – so one of the things I realized is, you know, I get asked to do um, some consulting on things that I'm completely capable of doing, but they wouldn't be in my joy box, I call them today. Mm -hmm. Um, and I only have so much time in my life I want to uh, be doing in here. So for me, it's good customer service for me to find other good referral partners. Mm -hmm. Because if I can find good trusted referral partners, that's a great service to say that's not really in my wheelhouse right now or I'm um, already booked. But here's two other good people that would serve you well. That's customer service mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I, I agree 100%. And it's a, it's an abundance mindset too, that there's plenty of clients out there needing help. Um, I mm -hmm. certainly, neither one of us, I think both of us are probably turning away customers. Like, like mm -hmm. I don't have time right. or I've got to, yeah. I've got to, uh, I can't do that until for six months. And so, but I do know mm -hmm. this person. And so we're both getting to that place. Um, and I think that's only going to provide better customer service um, because you're getting the ideal client and you're having those deep conversations, plus you're referring on people, things that aren't really in your joy box, your wheelhouse, or just your lane of, of things you want to do. Right, right. right. Yeah. It's, it's, and there is a balance you have to find of um, the commitment piece to it, you know, um, you know, do they really want to invest in it? Or are they going to be bitter if they're investing in it? And what's mm -hmm. their expectations of outcomes and all this? Because I learned this in business uh, many years ago was, 
no vendor or consultant is ever going to solve your problem alone. Mm -mm. Uh, You can see the best software demonstration in the world and think, okay, that's going to solve our our CRM is going to solve the problem. It takes a leadership and commitment to anything. The same with professional development. No consultant is going to solve your problems. It's a joint venture and you have to work together on it. Absolutely. And it's not something that could be completely on the back burner. You know, if you're going to become a pro tennis player, you don't just play on Saturdays. Right. (laughs) You you really have to show up and put it in your calendar if it's important to you. And if your development, that's why I think a coach, having a coach is helpful because you have scheduled appointments. There's accountability measures. Um, you're checking in with your team. Like there's an actual a, a system, if you will, that helps you to be accountable and to continue and to see over a period, I would say a, a good year of coaching, you should be able to see some some significant improvements in your life. Six months is really ideal t- for the starting point, but I think that relationship takes a point. It's getting to know each other. It's building trust. It's then it's mm-hmm. it's using that time to actually, as issues come up, work through them as they come up. Rather, it ends up being even though it's executive coaching, it could be home life issues. It could be with their kids. It could be with yes. you know yeah. some of these relational issues follow them because it's behavioral and it's habits that they've gotten into and they've not been aware of them and they show up at work and then they find out their wife says that too. And, Oh, my daughter said this. So when we start to find out, yeah, these are some things that you're getting. These are themes that you're hearing or you're being perceived this way. So now we have three people that are perceiving you in this way. So maybe it is closer to the truth, right? Yeah, I remember when I hired my executive coach and it was a six month program and I just thought six months, that's so long and we're going to meet every week and oh my goodness, but uh, she explained it well and it's exactly what happened, which is what happens with my clients is each week working with real life situations, the conversation that you need to have in the meeting on Wednesday what are you uncomfortable about? Okay, let's prepare for this. Let's talk about that. And then how did it go? What do you wish you would have done differently? Working with real life situations is the best way to learn Mm -hmm. uh, across the board. And I I do tend to find some of my clients that will do um, three month, almost, um, almost all of them renew at three months for another three months. Mm -hmm. It really does take six months uh, of really working uh, together with real life situations. Yeah, one of the things I'm doing right now that's kind of fun is I'm having a couple of coaching pairs. So they're both EDs and they're in both they're in nonprofits and they are pairs, pair, peer mentors and they have coaching with me. And I, I and, and this just that's started neat. and we're working together for 6 months. So at the end of this 6 months, I have three three groups of them. And I am really excited to see how this goes because I've never done it this way. But and it is I, a unique, yeah. And it actually, it makes it more cost effective for them. Not to mention they have another executive director that they're building a, a little deeper relationship with and getting each other's feedback and holding each other accountable. So I feel like this coaching thing might be a way to make it a little less expensive and get people in that might be hesitant for getting coaching because they think, oh, it's too expensive or my board Mm -hmm. won't approve it. Or what I see too is I'm afraid to ask for coaching because it makes it look like I don't, that I need help. Yes. I actually had that. I remember talking to my board chair and I said, I feel, I feel a little guilty. Like I should figure this out. Right. I feel a little guilty asking for that. And she had the perfect response. I had amazing board. She said, okay, if you had one of your executives come to you and they wanted to grow their leadership skills, would you support it? And I said, absolutely. She said, so why would we not support the senior leader of our organization in the same manner? Um, So you shouldn't think that way. And what I'm just going to say about leadership is leadership is hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is not easy. I do not care. If you have a team, leadership is hard, especially today. People are on edge today. There's more difficult things in business ever. So I can't even imagine uh, my life had I not had that. It it just, and they weren't huge, profound things, but it was really impactful for me and really gave me a different perspective of how to approach things uh, 
And so I just, I'm, I'm a big believer in it. And people see, see things in you that you might know, but you don't know how to articulate it or the impact yeah. that you can yeah. improve in. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you giving your time to our listeners and um, Credible Advantage is uh, her consulting business. They do, she does all kinds of um, communication trainings, um, crucial conversation, executive coaching, anything else that I haven't added? Uh, A lot around uh, building culture uh, and also um, being a a mission-led organization. And I'm not talking not profit. I'm talking stay focused on how you serve your customer and how you're changing their lives. And how do you change your leadership to go from a uh, an outcome based profit only numbers only organization to really uh, building a culture around good leadership around uh, those things? So that that is, uh, yeah, a lot of the things. A lot of the trainings that I do and building accountable teams. A lot of times we hear great culture and we think about fun in the office, mm-hmm. but culture is also accountable to each other mm-hmm. to, you know, and, and being more strategic. Um, and that's the other thing. I do a lot of training on how to build strategic thinking skills and just being a more strategic leader. So it's my pleasure. It. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, I I hope that we can get to work together a little bit more in the future and uh, collaborate, Absolutely. collaborate on things and send each other business. And um, please Feel free to check out her website and thank you all for listening to the Leader You podcast where we discuss 25 leadership competencies and try to give you tools and tips for building those strategies and tools. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Did you know that Black River offers a learning management system with over 10,000 development topics? The Leader U Learning Management System is an affordable option that empowers organizations to manage and curate in-house learning development opportunities. The built-in calendar and scheduling system can be used to coordinate compliance courses such as HR Respectful Workplace and IT Cybersecurity, or lunch and learns on topics such as motivation, self-leadership, and leading more effective meetings. At Black River, we are dedicated to providing a learning solution that focuses on engaging employees in their own self and team development. Our clients use the Leader U Learning Management System to remove barriers through accessible and self-paced micro-learning content, save time with the centralized and automated training assignments, promote more meaningful team discussions, issue certificates of completion and track development efforts, and enhance and simplify onboarding efforts. Contact us for more information on our learning management system at info at blackriverpm.com.